So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jakub Wondowski. I work as a DevOps engineer at DevAE. And today I'd like to tell you a bit about image optimization at the edge at the journey that I went through uh, some time ago. So it doesn't really matter what kind of site you run, whether that's like a small intranet or like a large e-commerce site, you're going to have images on your site. And you have to deal with them somehow. So there's a couple of options that come with uh, AM out of the box, but there are also external solutions that you can use to handle those images. And be before we move on, I'd like to start a quick poll just to you know get some information from you guys, what you use when it comes to uh, assets and like how that um, how that actually um, is being done in other projects. Okay, so so far it seems that AMDAM is the most popular option, which is probably not a surprise. Okay, so that's that's how most people do uh, asset management, so using AMDAM. But is this like the only option? There, there's a couple of things that uh, you can use. So first of all, there are like built-in workflows, the, the rendition workflow kicks in whenever you upload a new asset to them and some set of renditions will be generated. Uh, of course, you can extend it and apply some custom workflows, for example, to remove metadata or run some external command. Like I, I do recall a project where we had to like run a specially like crafted image magic command with like 20 different parameters that were probably developed like for a couple of years. Uh, before they actually decided that okay, that's that's the, that that's exactly the thing we want. So th that's also an option. Uh, back in the day, so I'm quite sure it's no longer possible with AM as a cloud service, but uh, offloading was possible. So you could set up additional AM auto instance and offload all the image processing there to like avoid overusing or overutilizing the the primary uh, AM auto instance. And of course, there is a dynamic media that uh, Stefan was uh, talking about this morning. But is this like the, the only set of solutions that, that we have currently? Well, not really. So this is like our starting point. So we had a project back in the days. Um, and this is essentially a snippet from the markup that uh, we used to produce. So this is like a picture tag with a set of source sets for different like viewports. And it was like generated by our own image component. And we were kind of happy with it. Like we've been using that pattern for many, many years. And like some of you may think that's that's like a job done. Like you don't have to do anything extra with it. And up to some extent, that's true. Some of you may wonder like that's not the markup that core components produce. And you're right. Uh, as I said, this was our like our own image component. And like back in the days, it was probably core components was not even a thing. So yeah, we thought, okay, that's the job done. We're going to reuse exactly the same pattern that we've been using for years. And like, we don't have to do anything extra. But then we need to face with some like uh, real requirements that uh, started to uh, came from, from the client. So first of all, they said, you know what? We'd like to use those new fancy image formats that uh, was like made available uh, recently, like WebP. Can we do it for us? And like by default, you just can't serve WebP off of AEM. Then they said, you know what? We have some metadata embedded in every single asset, like the GPS coordinates or uh, the gear that the given photo was uh, taken with, like the, the, the lens and the, the exact camera model. We don't need that. That's completely redundant. Let's just remove it from, from all the assets that we've uploaded so far. Then they say, you know what? We have like a couple of terabytes of those TIFF files. And every single one of them is like at least 300 um, megabytes. And we'd like to process them uh, like in, in like a bulk manner. So we'd like to put, that, put them uh, on AM and then process them uh, in a single batch. Uh, then they said, you know what, that default quality level that we have is slightly too high. Could you just redo all the workflows for all the assets we've uploaded so far to like reduce it to 78%? And like if you have in mind that the previous bullet point, it's 
it's getting harder and harder. Then they say, you know, some of those products are out of stock. Could you just blur them to like improve the, the visual feedback uh, for all our clients? And then there was like, we'd like to put a small badge on every product that is on sale now. Could you do it for us, please? And then another thing came, um, uh, essentially that analytics system uh, said that there's like 15% of our users, they, they use low speed connections. Is it possible to reduce the image quality for them somehow, like just to improve the overall experience? And like, I didn't make that those examples up. Those are the real requirements that we had to deal with. And of course the list goes on, but that, that's the reality. So what, what was the actual use case? So the project was an e-commerce site, a fairly large one. We had two image sources. Uh, one of, of course was AM, that was for marketing editorial assets. And there was also an external system for all the product assets. And of course, as you can imagine, since that was an e-commerce size the site, it was like image heavy platform. So there were images everywhere, like product listing, even on a single product detail pages, there were a bunch of images that we had to deal with somehow. And since we've been using Fastly for a couple of months now, like Fastly was chosen as a, as a CDN solution for that project. Uh, we figure out that they have that image optimizer um, thingy that we can experiment with, and maybe that's the thing we can we can use. So what, what that is what that thing is all about. So first of all, that allows you to manipulate your uh, the assets images specifically. So you can like cream crop them, set the width and high, put some overlays, blur the images, like combine a couple of images uh, with each other. So th those kind of transformations. Then they allow you to like transform one image format to the other. For example, the WebP can be dynamically generated for you, which is quite handy. Uh, you can also adjust the, the, the image level, the, the quality level that uh, is being served to the user. And that metadata removal thing is like out of the box. So as you can see, that ticks off quite a few uh, of those requirements that came in. So we said, why not to try it? So we decided, yeah, let's let's do a quick POC and figure out if that's a thing and something that we can like benefit from. So what are the prerequisites? First of all, you have to have that image optimizer enabled. This is like a, an add-on that you enable for individual Fastly service. And by Fastly service, I mean like uh, it, it would be like oversimplification, but you can think of it like a virtual host. Uh, in your Apache config. So that essentially gathers a bunch of domains that you pointed at Fastly, and there is some logic associated with that. Uh, then you need to enable shielding. Uh, I'll explain what it is in a second. Uh, and finally, you have to adjust the configuration to leverage that uh, image optimizer. So what is shielding? Uh, so typically, whenever you have CDN in front of your application, whether that's AM or something else, it doesn't really matter. But typically you talk to the closest server, the closest edge server to your location. So if we have a look at the user in Washington, which is here in the bottom right uh, hand section, it's talk and we have a server located or a bunch of servers located in AWS in US East One region, which is in Virginia. Uh, the user can talk to that Virginia um, edge server as somehow that was figured out to be the closest to him. And then the request is proxied to your server, which is called origin in, in like CDN uh, naming convention. So that, that's a typical thing. Like, of course, there, it, it's slightly more complex in practice, but eventually that, that's the thing. Like you have a, a single server or a bunch of servers gathered together, like grouped together, a cluster of servers uh, that acts as a middleman between yourself and your hosting location. With shielding, you add yet another level. So that's like a CDN within your CDN. So let's have a look at an example here. So we have a user in Tokyo, and there is also a, an edge server in Tokyo. So that user will talk to the closest location. So the traffic stays in Tokyo. But instead of going directly from Tokyo to, to AWS in Virginia, 
we go through yet another Fastly server located in Virginia. And that's, that location is like configurable. You would like to typically, you would like to keep it as close to your origin as possible. So if your AWS region is US East 1, you would typically choose the Fastly Virginia server as, as your shield. Of course, you may have like multiple shields. And I mean like Virginia and let's say New York. Um, and you can load balance between them, but typically like a single location is selected for each um, for each origin and why that's even needed. So imagine that like most of your users is located in United States. So and and the cash cash servers will like cash servers based in the US will receive most of the of most of the traffic. But if you're connecting to the site from like a, different continent, let's say, let's, let's go back to uh, example, um, Japan example, Japanese example. So that, that, that Tokyo user talks to um, uh, your application. So instead of going directly, uh, he or she will go through that Virginia server and that significantly increases cash hit chance as like, if the vast majority of traffic is like located in a single region, it, it is highly possible that the, the object you asked for will be already there. So that's shielding, like a, yet another caching layer uh, in your application stack. So how does that work um, in our example? So let's say we uh, we are in Berlin, we request uh, an asset um, from our AEM stack, uh, but we have that set up uh, the Fastly setup in place. So we're gonna talk to the closest server, which let's say will be in Frankfurt. Uh, and that Frankfurt server, the, the called edge pop, pop stands for points of presence. Uh, instead of going directly to our origin, it's gonna talk to the shield pop, which we selected uh, like by hand and we set it to London as our AM stack is located in the UK. So that will be proxied to the London server. And instead of like fetching the the rendition that the user asked for, we like do a little bit of a rewrite and um, fetch the original asset instead. That get, gets cached at the shield level. Then the shield uh, pop will request or, or proxy the, uh, pass the processing on to the image optimizer service, which will do all the processing and serve the, the, the image, the optimized image back to the shield. So at shield level, we're gonna have two images, the original image and the, the one that got processed by the image optimizer. And then of course, that is sent back to the edge pop and eventually to our end user. And upon the next request, um, we just gonna stop at the, the edge location. Of course, if there is a cache miss, uh, we can fetch it from the, from the shield, but if we like request a slightly different rendition, we don't have to like refetch that origin again as it is already available at the shield level. That, that's one of the reasons why it is required. So what exactly we had to do to, to make that happen? So here's a, a snippet from our VCL configuration. Uh, at the top, you can see that VCL receive subroutine, which is the, like, the entry point to, to the entire configurations. And this is, uh, this is triggered right after the request is received by the edge server. So first of all, we need to get rid of all the query strings um, just because we're gonna use query strings later on to instruct the image optimizer what we'd like to do with the image. Then we check if that, if that re requested asset is meant to be handled by our AM stack. So we check if the path matches to a certain pattern and if the selected backend is the dispatcher server. And then we set a set of headers and query strings. For example, we set the quality level, we enable auto FP conversion, and then we extract the width from the image. Uh, you've probably spotted that before as we have the width and height of the image uh, in the URL. So we extract the width, and then we check if that width is actually valid as we allow only certain set of um, renditions. Mm, so if that matches, then we like set yet another query string to in inform the, the image optimizer that we'd like to reduce the width of, of the image. And of course, if we if you have other like backends that, that also serve images, you can like expand that configuration further. 
so with that in place, we have to do one more thing, uh, which is that uh, URL rewrite that I mentioned before. So essentially, we need to strip the, the a few last sections of the URL and request the original image instead of the rendition that a web browser requested. And we trigger that into subroutines, which is VCL miss and VCL pass. And those are uh, the situations where the VCL miss essentially means that there was a cache miss and VCL pass means that we explicitly set to bypass the cache and, and request that uh, particular object from the origin. Okay, so let, let's sum it up what we use uh, image optimizer for. Uh, we generate renditions, we convert images to WebP format, we remove metadata, which is like out of the box feature. You don't have to configure anything to make it happen. And we adjust the quality. So how does that look in practice? Uh, I wish I can show you that like in, on the real application. Unfortunately, I can't do it, but I have a few, uh, commands that uh, I've used to actually test it. So here we have a, a request for a, for a rendition. Uh, that, of course, goes through all the layers that I described before. And as you can see, we have a couple of interesting information in the response. So first of all, uh, the content type is image JPEG, so exactly the one we requested and that can be deducted from the, from the URL. Uh, we have the e-tag, which was dynamically generated by the image optimizer. So that is essentially like a checksum from the content of that generated rendition. So it is always the same, which is a quite handy thing. Uh, the next header we, we can see here is that Fastly IO info, which contains six properties. The first three are for the input, and the, the last three are for the output. So we have the input image size, input dimensions and input format. And then we have the output, dim uh, output size, output dimension and output format. So as you can see, we have like um, the, the size uh, of the original image, uh, the IF um, SZ uh, parameter, um, that's the original image size. And the output size uh, is the one that, uh, that image optimizer generated. So like roughly, like if you look at those numbers, that's like, 40% uh, of the original image size. Uh, and as you can see also, the, the output size matches to the content length header, uh, which is at the very bottom. But what's gonna happen if we request the original, the, the same asset, but we instruct the, the server, uh, or Fastly in this case, that we do accept image WebP format. Uh, and it, there's a accept header at the end at the end of the command. So we have nearly the same output, but uh, if we look at the fastly IO info header, we can see that the input was exactly JPEG file, the original one that uh, we get from got from AEM. And the, the output is WebP now, which is confirmed by the both content type and the OFMT property in fastly IO header. And as usual, the the, out, uh, the the size matches, which is like even smaller. That was exactly the same asset than before. So right now it's like about 30% uh, of the original asset. And it was all fine. Like we did it super quickly, but we didn't really know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a kind of a funny story, but yeah, uh, it, it turned out to be a, to, to be a trap. So we went live. Uh, we went live uh, with that, um, and it was a like a website with a significant traffic, like a couple of thousands of requests a second. Uh, so it was like a quite popular website. Uh, so we went live. This is a um, screenshot from the Speed Curve application that we use to run synthetic tests on the site, uh, and we run it. And we thought, okay, we, we had a successful test on lower environment. Let's just do it and it will be a walk in the park, right? Well, uh, that's the output. So we went live uh, for AEM assets first, as remember, we have another asset source as well. And the image size increased nearly like three times, which was essentially 
the opposite effect that we expected. Uh, and yeah, what happened? So the deployment was composed out of two stages. Uh, the first one is that VCL change, so exactly those snippets that I presented before. Uh, and the second one is that image optimizer enablement that we had to do uh, in the configuration. And it turned out that the order matters. Uh, we didn't pick it up on lower environments just because like there was no that much of a traffic and the, the issue like silently went away. We didn't even spot it. Uh, but we did it in exactly this order. So we first we deployed that VCL change. Uh, so all of a sudden, every single rendition request, it's like silently transformed into original image request. So every single image that we were serving was the actual orig original image, not the rendition uh, that was referenced in the HTML markup. Uh, and then we enabled IO, which was like too late because we already like rewrote those paths and it was like that was the the root cause of the problem so we should do it in the reverse order so first enable the uh, uh, image optimizer and then uh, apply those configuration changes so we redid it uh, and here's the the output so that's exactly what we expected uh, the image size uh, was reduced by 26 percent uh, which is Kind of significant number. It's not like two percent. It's twenty six percent. On average, it was like thirty, around thirty percent. Uh, then we did yet another uh, go live or soft go live for that uh, for the the second um, image source. So that that for those product images, um, and the image size decreased by thirty percent. And as you can see. The other like sections like the, the HTML size and CSS size, those were like different uh, as well as we introduced some changes alongside uh, that. But the, the, the main thing we should focus on here is the, the image size, which, which is in the middle, which essentially means we have a 30% improvement for, for images. And some of you may wonder like why we didn't use dynamic media. So there, there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, implementation cost. So like we had Fastly already present in our application stack. So it was kind of pointless to like look for like third party solu solutions if we have something that we can just like take off the shelf and, and try out. So that, that's the first reason. Uh, the second thing is that it took us literally one working day to implement all those changes in the config, deploy them, measure them, and test them. So it was like we were like extremely happy with the result, uh, and it took us like literally one working day to, to to do it. And last but not least, we didn't have to introduce any change in our AM code base. We just like used exactly the same version that we've been using for for a few weeks. And we didn't have to touch it at all, which is well quite handy. Like especially if you if we consider the amount of time we have to spend on like faster deployment versus like AM deployment. Uh, the next thing is since we have like non AM image sources as well, uh, we would like to have like unified, consistent approach across all the origins and not focus specifically on AM. So that was like certainly a good fit. I mean, that image optimizer was a good fit for us. And the ongoing cost, that's the last but not least, uh, certainly. Uh, both dynamic media and image optimizer are not free. You have to pay for that. Uh, but uh, we did some back of a napkin math, and it turned out it is like order of magnitude cheaper. And we exactly we have all those things uh, that we need available pretty much right away. And of course, that doesn't mean that dynamic media is like wrong or bad choice for your image optimi optimization activities. It's like slightly different. Like dynamic media is like definitely like it, it is tight integration that is tighter tighter integration with AM than the solution that I presented. Like. The image optimizer tends to be generic. Dynamic media is like AM focused, 
you can use it outside of AEM, I guess, but like it works best with, with AEM. So since we have those requirements, not the others, and like the we, we eventually decided on, on image optimizer instead of dynamic medium. And yeah, that's all I had for today. Let's have a look for some questions. Oh yeah, uh, there's a, the, the first one from York. Yeah, so essentially that that's it. Like image optimizer is a generic solution. Uh, it, it's not like bind to any particular technology as long as you can fetch an image and you can do some further processing with it. And dynamic media is, again, AM specific, I would say. Uh, okay, let's have a look at another one. In the start of the talk, uh, you mentioned uh, HEF and HEC, a format that Fastly supposed, uh, supposedly does not support. Did you get it working? And if so, how? No, we didn't have that. Like the, the only uh, requirement we had when it comes to um, those specific standards was like WebP and like EXIF data removal. So we didn't have to bother about those. All right. Do we have any other questions? All right. So I can't see anything else. So thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of the day.